This video is continuing right where the previous video left off. I'm in part 080 matrix algebra. All the code that I'm going to show you in this video works perfectly in Octave exactly the same way as I'm demonstrating it here in MATLAB. I'm not going to scroll down, I'm going to scroll up. I skipped this in the previous video because there's some background information I need to give. It's around line 150 of the document, linked to all these documents in the video description. It's example 10.2 force vectors. It is from the book MATLAB for Engineers, 5th edition. And I'm going to first go to the PowerPoint slides to introduce this question. Okay, so a bit of background information. Statics is the study of forces and systems that do not move, as opposed to dynamic systems. And these forces are usually described as vectors. The sum of the vectors is the total force on the object. There is an unfortunately large amount of notation involved with vectors, and it's my understanding that different fields use different notations. So like if you're in physics as opposed to math as opposed to engineering, you might be seeing different units. So let me give you just a little brief summary, even though it doesn't impact the code that we're going to write. So V hat here, this little up arrow or caret above the V is often called a hat, like a hat you would wear on your head. And that's typically used to indicate that that variable is a vector. It represents a vector of values rather than just a single value. Now there's no way to type that into MATLAB, but this is just in mathematical notation. And then this first line up here is just saying that V hat is composed of V1, V2, and V3, which are just numeric values. They're just scalars. And the meaning of that is that V hat is the vector that you would get by moving V1 distance along the X axis plus V2 distance along the Y axis plus V3 distance along the Z axis. And wherever you end up, that's the end of your vector. You can think of the vector as taking a piece of string and starting the string at the origin and then stretching it out to the location that you end up by performing that walk, right? V1 distance along the x direction, v2 distance along the y direction, v3 distance along the z direction. It's often also described as a linear combination of unit vectors. So i, j, and k are these unit vectors. So i, for example, also known as bold i or e sub 1, depending on your uh, field of study you're in probably, is 1, 0, 0, which simply means unit or one distance along the x-axis and zero distance in any other direction. And similarly for y and then similarly for z. So we could write out our vector v as v1, that's a scalar, times the vector i hat plus v2 times j hat plus v3 times k hat. This is all just notation and terminology. Next slide. The magnitude of a vector is the distance from zero of that location that you end up. So again, you think of that string that you're stretching out from the origin to the tip of wherever you ended up by doing this walk, that's the magnitude or length of your vector. If you're in three dimensions, the way you would calculate this is the square root of v1 squared plus v2 squared plus v3 squared. If you're in two dimensions, well then it would just be the square root of v1 squared plus v2 squared, which you should recognize as your basic distance formula. Further notation, however, is that the magnitude of a vector is often written as, as this sort of double bar and then the vector and then double bar, or, unfortunately, as what looks to me like an absolute value. Now there's actually a good reason behind using the absolute value symbol because if you're in one dimension, the absolute value actually is the magnitude. So for example, what is the magnitude of number two? Just like if you walked distance two along the number line, how far away from zero are you? Well, obviously you're distance two, but take it in the other direction. If you walk to negative two on the number line, how far away from zero are you? Also distance two. We wouldn't say you're distance negative two, we would say you're distance positive two because distances are always measured as positive. And if you think about this diagram right here, what would be that linear distance, that one dimensional distance? Well, we just get rid of the v2 squared and the v3 squared. So it would be square root of v1 squared, which if you think about it, would be the absolute value. There's no implied plus or minus on the outside of this square root. It is a positive square root. So anyway, that's just some background on why the notation looks the way it is and how you calculate the magnitude of a three-dimensional vector. It's just a short little extension of a two-dimensional distance function from the like Pythagorean theorem of like right triangles. All right, continuing on. What we're interested for this example, though, is finding the angle 
between two vectors. And to do that, we're going to use the law of cosines. Now, there's a lot on this slide, and I a little bit regret that, but the law of cosines is right down here in the bottom left corner. And then there's an arrow, and there's like a different expression of the same law of cosines, where they just took the denominator and multiplied both sides by it, and, you know, canceled. So don't even worry about that. Law of cosines is right here. Now above that, they just give notation for these two vectors, two three-dimensional vectors named a and b. And suppose we want to know the angle between a and b. Well, this law of cosines gives us a way of figuring that out. The cosine of the angle between the vectors is equal to the dot product of a and b divided by the magnitude of a multiplied, regular scalar multiplied, by the magnitude of b. Now this right here is just showing how you would derive the dot product from the law of cosines. So you could calculate the dot product instead of just pairwise multiplying and then adding together the results. You could, if you wanted to, although it's usually way harder, find the magnitude of a, multiply by the magnitude of b, multiply by the cosine of the angle between them. That's pretty rare. Usually you want to use the law of cosines for something else because the dot product is a super easy calculation. Usually we want to figure out the angle, which is what we're actually going to do. So if you look at this top item right here, this top equation, if we just take the inverse cosine of both sides, we have what theta, the angle between the vectors, equals. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to use that to calculate the angle between vectors. So suppose we've got a vector a, 5, 6, 3, and a vector b, 1, negative 3, 2. We want to know the angle between them. Well, this is how we would do it. The angle equals the inverse cosine, because we took the inverse cosine of both sides to like cancel out that cosine on the left. Inverse cosine of the dot product of a and b divided by magnitude of a times magnitude of b. And then they literally just plug in all the numbers and show you what it would be. And there it is right there, 1 point, roughly 8, 1 point 8. Now let's actually do it in MATLAB. So I actually wrote this so that I had to type in the inputs. I don't really actually care for that. Um, so I'm just gonna copy them in very quickly from the slides. I'm gonna accelerate this in the video. 5, 6, 3, and 1, negative 3, 2. All right, now let's run this section. We'll run it first and then we'll discuss the code. Great, there's our solution, right? I, I just said it was roughly 1.8. There it is, 1.8 radians, or if you prefer degrees, about 103 degrees which unfortunately is roughly the temperature outside right now where I live. Okay, so let's go see how we did it. Well, first I calculated the magnitude of A. I think it's useful to separate out that calculation just so that just so you don't have a really long complicated calculation that you have to deal with right here. So magnitude of A, very unfortunate variable name that I chose there, sorry about that. Magnitude of B, same thing, square root of the sum of the element-wise squared values of that vector. And then the cosine of theta, so not the angle, because I haven't taken the inverse cosine yet, but the cosine of theta is what I named my variable, to remember that and remind myself I haven't taken that inverse cosine, is the dot product of a and b divided by magnitude of a times magnitude of b. And then finally, arc cosine, or inverse cosine of our variable, is our solution in radians. a cos d, d for degrees, is our solution in degrees. And then I display it all out right here. And that is how to use the law of cosines to find the angle between vectors in MATLAB. And that's all for this video.